the book of Haggai is what one calls the minor prophets. But although they are called minor, the truth of the matter is it has very, very important messages. There are four different messages. You know, first message, there is a clear call to rebuild. That's what chapter 1 is tell, telling, telling us. So, and that's relevant for us today, rebuilding the Church of Christ. In the second message, there's a discussion on promise of the future glory of the temple. We are learning that the temple will look fantastic. Verse 1 to 9 of chapter 2 is, is talking about this, this promise of a future glory of, of the temple. Then the third message is in is still in chapter 2, verse 10, uh, verse 10 to, nine, to 19, and he's talking about the blessing, the blessing of obedience and the con another condemnation of disobedience. In other words, if you obey, you'll be blessed. If you disobey, you'll be condemned. Then there's a fourth message that is talking about the the prophecy, messianic prophecy on Zerubbabel and of course the destruction of the Gentile rule. That's still in chapter 2 but now verse 20 to 23. So there are many messages in this uh, in this book that make it an important book even if we call it um, even if we call it uh, the minor <laughs> minor book because it isn't really minor. The message is not minor. The size of the book may be what is uh, compared with uh, Jeremiah or Isaiah, maybe what is being called um, minor, but the message itself is not actually minor. You know, the writer is Haggai, H A W G A I. And. Um, we can say that he's the tenth in order of the twelve minor prophets. Actually, he is the second shortest book in the whole of the Old Testament. And uh, it will be important that uh, you understand again, as I'm emphasizing, the fact that it's uh, one of the shortest books does not mean it's a message you can actually ignore, because it's a message every Christian needs. Um, You know, it's made up of four messages, like I have said, but the date of the book is around uh, 520 BC. So it's not too far away from the coming of Jesus Christ. It is actually written soon after exile. So this is what they call the post exilic message. It comes after Daniel has uh, pro has confirmed that the 70 years of captivity have finished and then Cyrus has issued a decree that they, they should go back to, the, the, those who are willing can go back and rebuild Jerusalem. So that's when his, this Haggai is talking, around 520 BC. Of the place and year of his birth and of his descent, there's nothing we know at all. Um, you can talk about the, the, his contemporaries are Ezra and Zechariah. So when you read Haggai, you may also need to read Ezra and Zechariah. You, you just look at Ezra chapter 5 verse 1, Ezra chapter 6 verse 14, but also skip over to Zechariah chapter 8 verse 9. These are his contemporaries. He commenced to prophesy in the second year of Dairus, the Persian king. He was called Pyrus Histaspesis. That gives you the date. Why is he writing the book mainly? To call the returnees, people who have come back um, to, to, to Jerusalem, to complete the temple, because they have arrived, but they are not building the temple. That word written is, I will have it in Rwanda, where, although it's not, not pronounced, but uh, some people 
uh, returnees because they had they were born outside until the the genocide after the genocide is when they came back so we can talk about returnees and that's what those are the people being addressed by the by Haggai um you can imagine the, the, the 18 years had already gone since they came back but somehow the temple which is supposed to be central to the, to the kingdom of Israel was still undone you know the mission was actually fulfilled because the returnees obeyed and they built a temple obeyed obeyed a smaller temple than Solomon's and it was actually completed within five years. Solomon took quite a bit of time. So they are building it from 520 down to 515. So the, mes the message God gave to Haggai actually did, did operate. You know, just to understand the background, Cyrus had allowed 50,000 Jews to return, but had no temple who were, but they, they had no temple and therefore they could not do sacrifices. First they built an altar and started sacrifices without a temple that the returnees did, then set foundation for a, a temple. You know, the neighboring people who are called Samaritans, you know, harassed them until finally they actually stopped building. Jews had started building the temple previously, uh, uh, but then they stopped. For how long? 16 years. And uh, they could not just be seen. It was a sign that the, the Samaritans had uh, warning and threats, had won the day. That we can also get from the book of Ezra, chapter 4, verse 5. And verse 24, chapter 5, verse 16. Indeed, the Jews became indifferent and began to build for themselves beautiful houses. As we read in Haggai, chapter 1, verse 4. Yet, they have not built the house of the Lord, but they are building for themselves fantastic houses. What was causing that? Of course, fear was one of them, but there is also spiritual apathy. Um, and that, so there isn't any motivation to actually go back to the completing of the of the temple of the Lord. That is until this this guy called Haggai comes, and he challenges them with his prophecy, until they actually take action. Meanwhile, important events were taking place in the Persian Empire itself. You know, in 522 B.C., um, dies and the throne had been seized by a, a usurper, the so-called Sudos Nedis, who held it, however, for only seven months. He was murdered by Darius and, and the latter was elevated to the throne. But this gave other abacious pretenders cause to rebel and many provinces revolted, among them Susiana, Media, Assyria, Armenia, Parthia, and others. Um, you will see the, the Persian Empire was covering the, most of the, the known world, but as the Darius takes over, there are still some of the provinces who don't want to be ruled. Altogether, Darius fought 19 battles in trying to put these, 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 these many rivals and did not succeed in vanquishing all his foes till the year after Haggai prophesied. These accounts for the prophet's repeated allusion to Yahweh's shaking the nations. Isn't that what he's saying in Haggai chapter 2 verse 6 and 7? Haggai seems to regard the shaking of the nations as a precursor of the Messianic age. It was therefore important from the prophet's point of view that Yahweh's temple should be made ready for the Messianic event. 
that it might become the religious center of the whole world. The exact date of Aga is preaching, like you have seen, is around 520 BC. And uh, Darius has, 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 come, has come to the throne after that. With this accession of Darius Hystaspes, which is a way of saying Darius, the son of Hystaspes, the tide turned. Darius was a true successor to Cyrus and favors religious freedom. Through the influence of the prophets Haggai and Zechariah, the people were aroused from their theology and the work of rebuilding was resumed with energy. And that is now around 520 BC. You see, the political climate has produced the Kairos movement. God had arranged in the setting up of this, of this temple. You know, like I've said, together with um, Zechariah, Haggai is writing in order to urge the renewal of the building of the temple, which had been suspended when the Cyrus uh, reign ended. And um, he obtained the permission and assistance of the king as we learn from Ezra 5, 1, and Ezra 6, 14. And meted by the high courage of these devoted men, the people went about their work with vigor, and the temple was completed and dedicated in the sixth year of Darius, within five years. So the temple is ready by 516 BC. Please note from Haggai 2, 18, the foundation were laid Four years later, in the sixth year of Darius, the whole structure was completed and dedicated. Ezra 6.15. Isn't that fantastic? But anyway, let's, let's look at um, the, 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 the scriptures in chapter, in chapter 1. Um, let's read the first, the first 12, 12 verses. Just to see what what he say in chapter in chapter one, because it's important to just hear the the Bible itself. A call to the build, uh, a call to build the house of the Lord, Haggai, chapter one verse one. In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet. Haggai, to Zerubbabel, son of Shittel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Zadok, the high priest. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say, the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remain, remains a ruin? Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but have said little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages, only to put them in a pass that holds, that are with holes in it. Verse 7. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up to the mountain, into the mountains, and bring down timber and build my house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expected much, but it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why? Declares the Lord Almighty, because of my house, which remains a ruin. But each of you is busy with your own house. Therefore, because of you, are, of you, the heavens have withheld the dew and the earth its crops. I called for a drought on the fields and the mountains, on the grain and new wine, the olive oil and everything else the ground produces. 
on people and livestock and all the labor of your hands. Verse 12. Zerubbabel, son of Chitel. Joshua, son of Zodak, the high priest. And the whole remnant of the people obeyed the house of the Lord, their God and message. The voice of the Lord, their God and the message of the prophet Agai, because the Lord, their God, has sent him, and the people feared the Lord. Verse 18, Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message to the Lord, of the Lord to the people. I'm with you, declares the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Rebubo, son of Shittel, the governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, son of Zodak, the high priest, and the spirit of the whole remnant, of the people, they came and began to work on the house of the Lord Almighty, and there with their God, on the twenty-fourth day of the sixth month. Um, it's important to just see that the passage ends with in the second year of King Darius. King Darius. So it's clear Darius is on the throne. Look at verse 1. And verse 1 we, we read in the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shittel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Zodok, the high priest. That's how letters were written those days. You are clear who you are, and you are clear who you are writing to. And um, so he begins, verse 1 begins with introduction, then we saw verse 2 to 6, we see an accusation of these people about their procrastination, then verse 7 to 8, you have seen the exhortation to rebuild. In verse 9 to 11, you have seen an explanation of people's impoverishment, why they are suffering, why things, the economy is bad. Then finally, from verse 12 to verse 15, we see a response to the prophecy by leaders and the people. And it will be important to, to understand that um, all of it is a message that we need to be to be dealing with. Let's just look look at, at it. So verse one is saying in the second day of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, what are an exact timing? In other words, it's not mystery or mysticism or mythology. It's the space he can he can he puts the direct timing so that we know it is history. Then he accurately names the people he is writing to. The first one is Zerubbabel, who was then the governor appointed by King Sarius of the new Ritanese kingdom. Then the second person who has to receive it, not just the king or governor, it's the high priest himself, Joshua, the high priest. You know, you can see why the letter of God complaining about the behavior of the people does not just go to everyone. It goes to the, to the leader of the church or the leader of the religion and the leader of uh, politics. And so when a country doesn't go well, it will be very clear that we need to understand that the blame is likely to be blamed on politicians and spiritual leaders. That the spiritual leaders, even when the economy is doing badly, the spiritual leaders do not go scot free. And the political leaders don't go scot free. Then in verse 2, we read this is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not yet come for the Lord's house to be built. You know, what are we learning? These people seem to say they have no time for God's work, they are too busy. You know, there's a, there's, a, there's a parable like that. I cannot come, you know, I'm married, I cannot come. And it sounds like that's what the, 
these uh, Israelites are doing. Too busy. Too busy to do God's work. Now, my friend, if you are too busy to give time to God, you are too busy to be alive. Because you see the breath you have has come from God. Can you imagine? You are too busy to have your quiet time. How could you have time to do other things when you have not had time with God who will help you in doing those other things? I'm too busy to witness. How could you be too busy to witness? Yet you are busy making money. Here I think the message Haggai is giving you and me is the importance of clear priorities. It should be God first, your spouse second, your children third, anything else, profession, whatever, must come into the fourth place. And so whatever you are, whenever you are dividing up your time, budgeting your time, ask yourself, is God having priority? Number one. Number two, is your family having priority? Number three, your profession. You know, you need to understand that in your profession, you can very easily be replaced. In your family, you are the only person who can be, who can be there. If you, if you leave your children, they will not have another father. You are their biological father, the only one. They are not two fathers, not two men fired father the same child. So how would you be allocating your time to where you can be replaced to, and leave out where you cannot be replaced? And then how would you not give God time, like I've just said before, if God is the one who has given you all the time anyway? You know, the leaders are the ones addressed with this. The leaders must hear the message first, take responsibility, and set the direction for the people. Verse 3 and 4, Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it time for you, for you yourself to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? <laughs> wow, what a question. No investment in God's house. All the money I have is just enough for my personal use. And yet, you are not just living in a house. You are living in a paneled house. Many people do that. They can't give money to God's work, yet they are driving a huge machine for a car. They cannot give any work, any money to mission, mission ventures, yet they are busy buying a new property. Hmm. So he's asking, is it time for you yourself to be looking after yourself and forget God's house? That's a question we all need to answer. You know, worship should be as good as the average worshippers. The worship house must be as good as average worshippers house. We are not asking you to build a temple that is that is that is not um, that is you cannot afford. But if you can afford a certain standard, the temple should be the same standard. In fact, therefore, it means that the church building should be should be as good as an average worshipper's uh, house. Because it's important to understand that. If you have enough money to build this type of a house, you have enough money to build up a church because after all, you are putting the church together. You know, we need to understand, of course, the church is not a temple. Um, so the building is not a major issue, but at least ministry funding needs to go into higher gear. Remember, all the money, 100%, belongs to God. So all you are doing, you are giving back a little. And um, that's what, what we are failing to do. I think we must invest in God's work, whether poor or rich, in good times and hard times. Just like you pay taxes, even during COVID, any time you pay taxes, how would you then, God who has given you all the money, all your wealth, how do you feel 
You are paying taxes, okay, and yet you can't, you are not giving any work money to ministry. What do I mean by ministry? You are not supporting people who are evangelizing or discipling people in order to influence your 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 surroundings. That's a, that's a big question. You cannot decide to preach after school since candidates of your preaching would have also left the school. So you need to you need to to be a person who divides your time. You know, some people say, you know, when I leave when I leave high school, I'll really serve the Lord. But then those people you are supposed to be reaching are in high school with you. Oh, when I grow old, I'll our witness. Now, many people have died then. It means we must learn that you cannot segment your life such that, that the fact when you are during your youth, you are not involved in ministry. Then you beg to be involved in order. No. Ministry must be combined with whatever you are doing. Remember the formula? Give time to God. Give time to your family. And give time to what, earning your daily bread. So it means all the time we must, of necessity, allocate time for God's work. You see, God's work will last a lifetime, and you need to be involved with it every stage of the way, not after you retire. So divide up your time, reorganize your time, so that you are making inroads for the sake of God's kingdom at any stage in your life. Otherwise, Haggai will be telling you, hey, look at the way you are getting promotions at work, yet you have no time for God's work. I think that's um, something that we need, to, we need to deal with. Verse 5 says, Now this is what the Lord Almighty says, Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but you have very little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages, only to put them in a pass with holes in it. You know, God blesses our efforts. But he is saying, if you really want his blessings, consider where your efforts are, pu you are putting in before taking them. Otherwise, God could cast your efforts, and you'll see you'll be putting a lot of effort, but the results will, will be low. You have no productivity, no contentment, no warmth from even clothes, and your savings, the bank will collapse. You will lose it. All because you do not use your money or your time, part of it, in order to extend God's kingdom. Whether you do do it as unto the Lord. That's Colossians 3.17. Whatever you do, do it as well. Only be involved in what you have a call to do by God. Your life is your mission. Otherwise, disappointed after reaching the top of the wrong wall. Isn't that what Steve Covey said? That you need to, whatever it is you are doing, you need to be sure you are doing what God has called you to do. So it's not just the preaching, even the professional work must bring glory to God. Success is not put, um, is, is not output itself, but doing what is your call to do. Hence, many people are adding up, committing suicide, and they discover they have, they have done so much, made a lot of money, but they can't find contentment. If you want contentment, do what God has called you to do. Every activity must be preceded by careful consideration as to whether that activity will bring glory to God and will be a benefit to mankind. That's what a guy is calling them. Consider your ways. Be, give careful thought to whatever you are involved in. Otherwise, you end up having no productivity, wasting your time, and yet you are trying all your best. The reason you are, you are not getting good productivity is because you are on your own. You do not have God with you involved in your work, involved in your business, involved in your investment. How do you expect to get God's blessings when you are doing it without him and without um, seeking his, his direction? So that's the introduction of Haggai. 
and he clearly wants us to consider our ways, to be careful how we live our lives. May we live it to honor God.